Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the International Arts Talk Series of the Faculty of Arts of Chalalongkorn University. I am Andrew Santos, and I'm going to be your moderator for this event. Before we get started, I would like to make some announcements. First, please ensure that you use the, the name you registered with us for us to monitor everyone's attendance. Also, please keep your microphones on mute to avoid any unnecessary noise that may disrupt the talk. And lastly, which I believe everyone is excited about, if you have any question, um, you may send us via Zoom chat or should you wish to ask the question yourself, feel free to send me a message and I will call your name so you can unmute your microphone. All right. So once again, um, thanks a lot for joining us today in another stimulating discussion on the talk titled Language, Fantasy, and Storytelling, How Humans Became Creative. To formally start today's program and to introduce our speaker, I would like to welcome on screen the Associate Dean of Internationalization and Organizational Image Enhancement of the Faculty of Arts, Assistant Professor Dr. Nirada Chitrakara. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to our fourth Zoom talk. And today we have our speaker, Dr. Andrew Hagerstone. And well, this, to, to tell you the truth, this is the first time I met him because, well, it's during time. And it's just that we just got connected through emails. And this is the first time we met each other. And, and then have a talk in person. So anyway, first I got a phone, uh, a telephone number, which I thought it was his wife, uh, Dr. Tika Pan. And then when I called and he answered the phone and it was, well, Dr. Hagerstone's voice. So anyway, I just invited him over and I was glad that he accepted it right away. So um, he agreed that he's gonna give us a talk on language and storytelling and human uh, creativity. So anyway, uh, first, before we get to his talk, I'm going to tell you about the background. Okay, uh, Andy is actually from Northumbria, which is my favorite area in England. And he graduated from York and he also studied in Newcastle too. And well, his degree is in philosophy, but besides being a scholar, he is also a mus musician and a teacher too. And at the moment, he is working with um, young aspired musicians, setting the bands up, right? As far as I understand. So anyway, today he's going to uh, tell us about his PhD dissertation on language, fantasy, and storytelling. He's going to share with us his views that he believes that the human ability to have fantasy and tell stories is one main cause of human evolution. So anyway, it'll be very interesting to see what he has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Andy Hagerstone. Thank you very much. Um, Joy, I'm just going to try and share my screen so we can get a presentation okay. going. Uh, just, I think when I share this, I'm going to lose sight of Zoom. So just somebody tell me if it's working or not. Great. Okay, we can see it. Excellent. Okay, so I'll just turn this onto the presentation mode. And I assume that's working all fine now. Um, okay, so to uh, to get us started, I guess the the main thing that I'm interested in is something of a puzzle. Um, now it's not a philosophical puzzle, uh, even though that's my my academic background. It's actually uh, something of a paleoanthropological puzzle, um, but I do think it has implications for philosophy, and I'm going to try and explain some of those implications today. Uh, so I want to kind of start off with some. I guess, fairly uncontroversial background to this puzzle. I say uncontroversial, you know, it's not to say that this isn't contested or that um, some of this might be kind of slightly uh, debated, 
but uh, there's some background that we need to establish to set up the puzzle that I'm interested in. So the background is this. Um, anatomic anatomically modern human beings came into existence sometime between 200,000 years ago and 150,000 years ago. And by around uh, 130,000 years ago and 100,000 years ago, they ultimately kind of left Africa and populated the rest of the world. Um, there may even have been as few as 600 breeding individuals who are actually responsible for the entire population of the world uh, as we know it today. Now, I say that stuff's kind of uh, uncontroversial, but there's some kind of more controversial stuff that I need to put in here uh, just to set up the puzzle in its entirety. So to do that, we need to kind of go back uh, a little bit in time to 1.6 million years ago. And at this point in time, uh, we see uh, precursor hominids. So the, the, the hominid line that uh, predates our own uh, Homo sapiens and look at what they were doing. And uh, in particular, what we see when we look at precursor hominids like Homo heidelbergensis or Neanderthals, uh, we see that their material culture was pretty static. So if you look at, for instance, their design of hand axes, um, there isn't a huge amount of innovation in the, the design of hand axes at all, not until around about 240,000 years ago where you see some variation. So if you look on the screen uh, now, you can see that at 750,000 years ago uh, and at 400,000 years ago, hand axes were pretty much the same uh, with very little innovation whatsoever. And it's only a kind of slight innovation when it does take place uh, that starts to occur much closer to the time when human beings came into existence. Now, there are still some interesting facts about these hand axes, I think, that are worth kind of pointing out as well. So the first thing is that these hand axes were actually overworked. In other words, they were kind of worked upon until uh, they were you know, suitable for the task they're designed for, but then the work continued after that. So they kept making changes to the hand axe design uh, to make it not just practical, but also aesthetic. So the, the, the evidence that you can kind of put together from reconstructing the strokes that they, the, the designers of the hand axes used to make it suggests that it got to the point of being practical, but they kept doing it in order to make it symmetrical and therefore kind of beautiful in a way. Um, and so this suggests that our aesthetic sense actually has quite a long evolutionary history, may, maybe even you know, going back as far as a million years ago. Um, and it also suggests that some aspects of, of our later creative thought were actually already in place, not just the aesthetic sense, but also a kind of visual imagination, the ability to manipulate an image of something uh, in the mind so that they could make the correct strokes to, to kind of design the hand axe in the way that they intended. Um, so beyond hand axes, there's actually little change uh, elsewhere in hominid, hominid material culture as well. So they, you don't see the adoption of, of new hunting techniques or new diets, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, everything is pretty static in terms of their culture. That is pretty much up until you get to human beings, Homo sapiens. So at the point that Homo sapiens uh, come into existence, we see a drastic change uh, in the way that uh, we developed our material culture. However, it's not right away. Um, so it actually takes a little bit of time for human beings to start innovating in creative ways. Um, so in other words, there's a kind of puzzling gap between the emergence of anatomically modern human beings, that is to say, human beings with our kind of physical makeup and then behavioral modern human beings, so behaviorally modern human beings, that is to say human beings who do the kinds of stuff that we do, like make music, make art, and so on. Um, so there's this kind of puzzling gap, and this is effect, in effect the, the puzzle that I'm interested in, uh, and it's often termed the puzzle of the creative explosion. So just to kind of explain why it has that, that name and, and what the kind of content of that puzzle is, 
um, is that we see this kind of uh, gap of maybe 100,000 years between the emergence of our kind of physical phenotype and our behavioral phenotype. Um, so in other words, anatomically modern human beings existed for a long time before behaviorally modern ones did. And then at some point around 60 to 80,000 years ago, we started innovating across a quite broad range of domains. So on the screen currently is a selection of archaeological evidence that show innovation in a number of different areas of human life. So we see new tool manufacturing techniques, uh, the development of new technologies, things like projectiles to, to use in hunting, uh, and then a shift from those hand axes that we looked at, which were kind of all-purpose multi-tools, kind of a Swiss army knife uh, tool, to more specialized tools uh, for use in making different kinds of crafts and for hunting in different ways. We also see a new diet emerge and alongside that new kind of methods of storing food and keeping it fresh. Um, we see increased population density, uh, the first kind of tentative evidence of ceremonial burials, you know, burials that accompanied with uh, grave goods, for instance. Uh, we see decorated artifacts or kind of bone carvings, uh, even possibly some numerical notation on some of these carved objects as well. Um, we also see the first unambiguous musical instruments. So the, the, you know, the emergence of things like uh, bone flutes. Uh, and we also see the creation of representational art. So not only carvings, but cave paintings as well. Um, and all of these innovations actually occurred within uh, a relatively short space of time. So it occurs, as, as I mentioned previously, in that kind of period around 60 to 80,000 years ago. And our creative output actually just kind of uh, has increased ever since. So the puzzle is this, um, what was it that had to get into place for humans to suddenly become so creative? Or in other words, uh, what drove the creative explosion? And so that's the puzzle that I'm gonna try and solve today. Um, and it's, it's best, I think, if we start with the imagination itself. So in philosophy, uh, creativity has, has been analyzed for, for thousands of years, so really going back to the ancient Greeks. And uh, it, it, to some extent, the analysis of creativity has been understood in terms of trying to set out the kind of necessary and sufficient conditions for creativity. Uh, generally speaking, um, philosophers agree that for something to count as creative, it needs to be original or novel. Uh, it has to have value, so be useful in some way. And it needs to have been done deliberately rather than accidentally. Um, but when it comes to analyzing the imagination, uh, philosophers have found that it's a, a much more kind of nebulous affair, something that's much harder to pin down and create a kind of simple taxonomy of. Um, so rather than getting a kind of simple taxonomy of the imagination, what you get is a kind of list of different kinds of imagining. So this includes things like propositional imagining, which is kind of imagining that uh, something is the case, uh, objectual imagining, which is imagining some object X or imagining a banana, for instance, uh, and then you can have experiential imagining, which is imagining experiencing a particular thing. So imagining experiencing eating a banana, for instance. Uh, imagining can be spontaneous, uh, as is the case in daydreaming. So in other words, it's something which isn't uh, something we actively seek to do. It just kind of happens to us uh, versus a kind of deliberate imagining, which is more consciously controlled. So when we set out to deliberately imagine some state of affairs or object. Um, imagining can also be solitary. It can be done on your own um, or it can be social um, where there's more than one imaginer involved. And we see instances or examples of this in things like episodes of pretend play in children where they might imagine some scenario and then play a game within that context. Um, now, what I ultimately want to argue is that a specific kind of propositional social imagining uh, in particular is key to solving the puzzle of the creative explosion. Uh, particularly what I want to argue is that it's imagining that is manifested as storytelling. 
that's the, the kind of thesis that I'm going to defend. And it's fairly obvious to say, or at least I hope it's fairly obvious to say that human creative cognition is kind of closely tied up with our faculty of the imagination. So in other words, our ability to think creatively heavily involves the use of the imagination. Um, but there's actually uh, a particular kind of imagining that I'm interested in, which is fantasy. So I'm going to kind of say a little bit about fantasy uh, later on and explain why it is that I think it's so important. But it's worth noting that philosophers have kind of neglected fantasy as uh, something which is connected to creativity. So in advocating for fantasy, I'm kind of breaking from philosophical tradition in some ways. So I'm going to need to defend uh, my, my kind of insistence on fantasy as important. Um, but we, we see the imagination connected to creativity in various ways. Uh, so I've mentioned already in creating the hand axes, we, we see an example of um, our precursor hominids using objectual imagining, imagining some object, picturing that object in mind uh, in order to create uh, a particular outcome, a nice symmetrical hand axe. Um, so we know that imagining was in place, and what I'm kind of arguing is that it's a specific kind of imagining, fantasy, uh, that needs to get into place in order to help solve the puzzle of the uh, creative explosion. So uh, this kind of disconnect between fantasy and creativity uh, in philosophical literature, I'm going to try and make a case for reconnecting the two and saying that fantasy and creativity are actually very closely linked. Um, so just to kind of recap, I guess, uh, so far, what, I'm, what I've basically suggested is that my solution to the puzzle of the creative explosion suggests that storytelling and fantasy are key drivers of creativity. Um, there's also a third component here as well. So not just storytelling and fantasy, but also language. And that's specifically language as a medium of storytelling. Um, you could argue that you can tell stories in other ways and not just through language. So you might be able to tell a story through art, through dance, through music, for instance. Uh, and some philosophers have actually argued that that may be the origins of the, the evolution of language itself. Um, but the, the, the thesis I'm going to defend is that uh, of a co-evolution between language, a tendency to engage in fantasy, and externalization of that tendency in the form of storytelling. I'm going to argue that that is what explains the rapid pace of innovation that you see in the paleoanthropological record that we just looked at. So to kind of explain how I arrived at this view, I think we need to first look at an alternative view. Um, so the particular view that uh, I, I want to look at is a one that tries to solve the problem in a kind of slightly different way. Um, so there, there have been a number of alternative solutions. I'm just going to look at one of them in, in some detail. But um, philosophers have generally uh, tried to approach this by saying or asking what the cognitive basis uh, was that would explain the creative explosion. So what needed to be in place? And as a kind of pretty universal rule, everybody agrees that language is one of those features. Um, so language has to have been in, a, in place prior to the creative explosion. But the problem with uh, pointing at language as a solution or just language on its own as a solution is that we know that language must have been in place well before the creative explosion took place. So why do we think that? Well, because language is a kind of universal, uniquely human cognitive trait, which suggests that it must have been in place before we started leaving Africa and populating the rest of the world. If that wasn't the case, then what would need to, to occur is that language would have to evolve, or that the biological basis for language would have to evolve uh, in, a, in different groups of people uh, all over the world at pretty much the same time. Um, and so the favoured hypothesis uh, amongst paleoanthropologists is that it must have been in place prior to, to leaving Africa. So the solution to the puzzle can't just be language. It has to be language plus something else. Um, and so the question then becomes, what is that something else? So what is it uh, in addition to language that we need to solve the problem? Um, and if we analyze the kind of creative capacities or imaginative capacities of precursor hominids and also non-human animals, 
then we can see that there, there's actually quite a rich set of uh, cognitive capacities in place uh, prior to language getting into place. So I'm going to kind of very briefly give some examples, which are in, in the very least say controversial, uh, but I'm also not going to kind of dwell too much upon uh, the details of these as well. We can pick it up in, in the questions and answers if, uh, if people want to, to do that. Um, so what capacities were already in place? Well, objectual imagining I've mentioned already, uh, that was used in Handex design, um, but also there's a kind of limited capacity to imagine the future as well. So we see this in various cases. Uh, one interesting example, at least uh, interesting to me, is that we see this uh, even in rats. They seem to be able to imagine the future. So if you do kind of neurological scans of rats that are navigating a maze uh, and you block off a part of the maze uh, that they've already been through, it seems as though uh, they can kind of, uh, the, the neurological patterns seem to reflect the idea that they're kind of going through in their mind something of a memory of the, the previous encounter of that maze, which suggests that they're kind of imagining what they're going to encounter once the, the barrier is removed. Um, we also see uh, lots of examples of animals that imagine alternative solutions to problems. So we see this in apes and in uh, also corvids as well, when we give them problem solving tasks. Uh, and these kinds of capacities imply the existence of a kind of underlying capacity for episodic memory, the ability to relive past events. Um, there's even some kind of tentative evidence, controversial evidence of pretend play in animals as well. So we see, for instance, uh, what appears to be apes pretending that inanimate objects are actually kind of animate objects. So we see, uh, for instance, a, an ape cradling a log as though it's a kind of a, an infant, a, a baby. Um, so you could argue that this is an example of pretend play in apes as well. If this is the case, then this also implies that there's a kind of underlying capacity for secondary representation. That's to say it's holding an object in mind as two things simultaneously, uh, holding it, an object in mind as a log and also as a kind of baby uh, chimpanzee or whatever. Um, so we kind of see this in, in other kinds of examples as well in humans, obviously, when, when uh, children uh, are involved in episodes of pretend play, uh, they might, for example, imagine that uh, a telephone, sorry, a banana is a telephone and kind of pick it up and try and call somebody, a grandparent or something like that. Um, it's also possible that uh, precursor hominids engaged in singing and dancing, uh, as I mentioned as well. Uh, so there could have been quite a lot of things going on uh, in kind of in evolutionary history that indicate a fairly rich uh, set of imaginative capacities. Now, as I've said, language gets into place after uh, these capacities emerge. And of course, we could only assume that language would enhance these imaginative capacities once it gets into place in our species. Uh, and despite this, um, there's still that kind of puzzling gap between the emergence of language as a kind of uh, biological basis um, and the emergence of behavioral modernity, creative behaviors like making art and uh, music and, and so on. Um, so there's this kind of puzzling gap still uh, nonetheless. So this puzzle still remains. Um, so the question is, what do we need then in addition to language to solve this puzzle? And the particular solution um, that I want to look at is the solution from Pachuto and Carruthers, who argue that the last thing that needed to get into place to kind of kickstart creativity was pretend play. So this view is kind of defended across multiple papers by Carruthers and by Pachuto and Carruthers. And so to some extent, this is kind of the, the foil that I'm setting my own view up against. So just to explain what their argument for this solution is, um, they basically argued that pretend play is a uniquely human uh, kind of activity. Um, so clearly in saying that, they're dismissing the kind of cases that I mentioned earlier, where apes seem to engage in, in pretend play. 
Um, I'm not adverse to dismissing that. I think it's it's going to be very difficult to make a case, you know, a convincing case that they're definitely pretending something is is such and such. Um, so they claim this is a uniquely human behavior. So that marks out as kind of a promising candidate since we are kind of uniquely creative as a species. Um, and they point out that pretend play makes use of a couple of different kinds of imagination, experience, uh, experiential imagining and propositional imagining. Uh, and both of these, they claim, uh, depend upon language. So what goes on in cases of pretend play? Well, children basically create a set of suppositions. They suppose that something is the case, and then they act as though those suppositions are true. So for instance, uh, a child who pretends a banana is a telephone, uh, they will act as though it really is a telephone, and then they'll treat that object as if it's a telephone and make calls on it, perhaps to their, to their grandparents, to loved ones, to family, to friends, whatever. Um, so this activity, the, the activity of pretend play, uh, actually, according to Petito and Crothers, um, gives some of the rewards of the real thing. So when a child pretends to call their grandparents, they actually get some of the kind of reward of the actual event itself. So they'll get some of the pleasure uh, they would otherwise get from speaking to their grandparents. And this is an important observation for my own thesis as well. So I want to kind of come back to this again, but I, I definitely kind of supporting this claim from Petruta and Crothers that um, rewards are kind of built into uh, the act of imagining. Um, so what this means, I guess, uh, is that we are kind of naturally motivated to engage in episodes of imagining, uh, particularly in ones that involve things that we desire. Now, for Petruta and Carruthers, there are a number of kind of adaptive advantages to engaging in episodes of pretend play. So an obvious one might be that you can kind of practice these skills. So if you pretend to hunt, uh, then you can kind of develop actual hunting skills. Uh, but more importantly, uh, according to Petruta and Carruthers, uh, engaging in episodes of pretend play also kind of exercises the cognitive muscles behind creativity in adults. So in other words, uh, exercising you know, those cognitive muscles by engaging in episodes of pretend play uh, as children should actually make us more creative as adults. Uh, and then creativity um, itself is actually adaptively advantageous. So that's really the kind of thing that makes itself visible to uh, evolution, the, the kind of creative output. So it's adaptively advantageous because in terms of natural selection, being creative is a good thing because it helps you solve problems. So in that case, you're more likely to survive and therefore reproduce and pass on the genes for uh, that kind of creative behavior. And also it's potentially advantageous from a point of view of, of sexual selection uh, because it makes us more attractive to the opposite sex because they can see that creative cognition uh, is gonna make you a suitable partner because you are good at problems. So um, this is uh, Carruthers and uh, Petito's case for the pretend play solution to the puzzle. Um, so why do I think this is incorrect? Well, the main reason is that it's simply not supported by the empirical evidence. So the best kind of overview of uh, empirical evidence we have into the link between pretend play in childhood and creativity in adulthood uh, as conducted by uh, Lillard and her colleagues. And they looked at kind of a, a, a huge range of, of, of relevant evidence to try and assess this exact kind of hypothesis. Uh, the result of that was that they found no persuasive evidence that pretend play in childhood is actually connected to creativity in adulthood. Uh, instead, what they found is that pretend play itself must have been the result of some other selected for trait. Um, so that leaves us with a kind of interesting uh, problem to solve if this uh, puzzle wasn't solved by the pretend play thesis and the pretend play thesis itself uh, just raises further questions, then we have more questions to answer with our own solution to the puzzle. So in other words, whatever the solution to the puzzle actually turns out to be, it would be a more persuasive solution if it could also explain how and why 
pretend play also emerged. So, you know, just as a kind of spoiler, um, I'm going to argue that my solution can answer that question as well. So um, what is the kind of case for my own solution to this puzzle? So just as a reminder, my solution is going to be a kind of combination of language, fantasy and storytelling. So to kind of make a case for that, we need to look at each component in turn. So the first component is language. And I just want to kind of make some observations about language and I guess the way that I'm approaching language uh, with respect to this thesis. So there's two different ways of studying language. You can study language as a natural object or you can study it as a cultural object. When we study language as a natural object, then what we're looking at is kind of the biological basis for language and for language acquisition, how we, how we acquire language. Uh, when we look at it as a cultural object, uh, conversely, we are looking at something like the development of natural languages. So languages like English, Thai, Mandarin, uh, and so on. So we can look at maybe kind of the history of the changes to those languages, how certain words came in and out of use, how certain grammatical forms came to be preferred, and, and that kind of thing. So there's two different approaches to, to examining language. And I think both are actually important here in solving the puzzle of the creative explosion. Um, so why is it that both are important? Well, first of all, we need to look at how and when the biological basis for language got into place. Um, so when did we acquire the capacity for language? And then we also need to look at how natural languages can drive cultural maturation. So how natural languages can actually make cultures more sophisticated and ultimately drive other kinds of creativity and innovation. So both of these are important uh, to uh, solving the puzzle uh, as I see it. Um, but to kind of take the, the first uh, approach first, uh, language as a natural object, then I wanna kind of point to the work of uh, what are called generative grammarians, people who are interested in how uh, grammar can be a kind of generative tool, a tool for kind of um, building uh, and, and generating sentences. Uh, and this work is seen in uh, primarily the, the, you know, the work of Noam Chomsky and his followers, uh, which include people like Wolfram Hinzen, who uh, was my old professor at Durham. Um, so this particular approach, um, is one which sees, oh, I'm just thinking to uh, draw on the, uh, <laughs> the presentation somehow, sorry about that. Um, this particular approach uh, investigates the kind of computational constraints on the rules of language. Um, so in other words, the kind of computational constraints that operate upon the grammars of particular language. Uh, and a theory of these constraints is what is known as universal grammar or UG. Um, so this, uh, this kind of set of constraints, this universal grammar is what determines every possible feature of natural languages, uh, things like Thai, Mandarin, English, and so on. So universal grammar de determines what the rules of grammar itself are within a language and also what phonetics are available to that language and also the way that semantics ultimately works within it. Um, so universal grammar is uh, kind of an important kind of uh, building block for language as a capacity uh, and is sometimes as a consequence described as a kind of language acquisition device. Uh, so in other words, what we're saying is that the kind of neurological adaptations that are specific to fully syntactic language are the very thing that allow us to acquire language in the first place. Um, so if we kind of think about the, the evolution of language, what we're saying is that at some point in our evolutionary history, before we left Africa and ultimately populated the rest of the world, certain neurological adaptations must have happened, which allow us to develop language. Not only do they allow us to develop language, but they also determine what that language will ultimately be like. Um, and so at this point, I wanna to turn to uh, a particular uh, philosopher Wolfram Hinzen and his view of what this kind of means for our understanding of language. 
So Hinzen argues, uh, as does Chomsky, as it happens, that the kind of the primary beneficiary of language is thought. So in other words, once language gets into place, its major impact is on the way that we think about the world. Uh, and in particular, what Hinzen argues is that the emergence of, or, or the kind of uh, the, the evolution of those neurological traits that I was talking about uh, gives rise to the emergence of what is called propositional thought. So thought that has a propositional structure. Uh, and what this structure can do is it can allow us to refer, for example. So we can refer to objects, events, and even other propositions. Uh, it can also kind of instantiate a subject predicate relationship between things. So for example, in a sentence such as John is tall, then we can establish a relationship between a subject like John and a predicate like being tall uh, and say, you know, of John that he is tall essentially. Um, so it instantiates that kind of relationship. And also as a consequence of being able to make utterances like John is tall, uh, it also yields a truth value. In other words, it generates kind of propositions which can be true or false. Um, so all of that is kind of very technical and interesting, I'm sure, but how does it help us solve the puzzle of the creative explosion? Well, the, 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 the solution that to help uh, to, to solving the problem comes in the way that Hinzen actually describes the computational process, which underpins language. And the way that he describes this is that it operates blindly on the symbols within the, uh, the computational uh, structure. So what we're saying in, by, by kind of asserting that is that we have this kind of uh, computational uh, process which generates sentences without any kind of commitment to the truth of that sentence or the falsity of that sentence or to the desirability of what that sentence is outlining. So we can generate a sentence like John is tall without necessarily being true that John is tall and also without you know, caring either way, you know, whether you know, it's not necessarily desirable that John is tall or that John is short. So the process that uh, we use to actually build up sentences, uh, which again, I'm kind of skipping over the detail of this because uh, it's not entirely necessary for my thesis that this particular account is, is correct, but I think this claim is very, uh, very useful for kind of uh, thinking about the, the, the problem of the puzzle of the ex uh, puzzle of the creative explosion. Um, so what we're saying is that this kind of computational process operates blindly. It doesn't have any commitments to truth or desirability. Um, so what it does instead is it kind of takes basic lexical items, what Hinzen calls lexical roots, and then classifies them in different ways, which then allows them to be combined with other lexical items so that we can eventually build up sentences. Um, so the way that they, they kind of classify these things uh, is by classifying them as nominal or as verbal or as clausal. And then the, the set of rules that is in place already from universal grammar then determines what can or can't be done with this lexical root once it's classified in a particular way. So in other words, if you classify something as a nominal, then that excludes a number of possibilities for what that sentence will ultimately come out looking like. So for instance, it excludes the possibility of, of the sentence being tensed. So it could never, you know, never have past, present, future tense in it. Uh, if you do that, then obviously that means the sentence is gonna, you know, not be a kind of sentence which can claim something about the way things were in the past. So the kind of the process that we're talking about here uh, is a one which ultimately determines um, how this kind of sentence will, will build up and the different things that that sentence can say as a result. Um, so the, the main point here to take from this is that human language is a kind of generative system which operates in a way which is kind of irrespective to truth or desirability. Um, so the primary impact, uh, as we said, of, of the emergence of language is on the way that we think. Um, and if that's the case, then we can see how the imagination can make use of this kind of linguistic resource. Uh, so for instance, it could be used to generate false sentences or combine simple ideas into kind of more complex ones, which may or may not be desirable. We can assess that later on. So this is actually a kind of infinitely powerful generative resource for the imagination. 
Uh, and so this is why I picked language as the first component of my solution. I should point out, so does pretty much everybody else as well, but that's my particular reasoning for it. Um, so now we can move on to the second uh, component, which, uh, as I've already kind of mentioned, is the idea of fantasy. Um, so fantasy, I've said previously, has been kind of historically dismissed by philosophers as kind of not really connected to creativity, or even as far as saying that fantasy is somehow uncreative. But why do they think that that's the case? Uh, well, for one, it seems that philosophers kind of dismiss it purely as a kind of form of wish fulfillment. Uh, so for example, examples, we, we kind of, uh, if we imagine or fantasize about the food we want to eat, um, but we can't currently have, or we imagine or fantasize about the sex we want, but we can't have, then this is really just mere wish fulfillment. Um, it's not particularly creative uh, form of imagining. So why is it not creative? It seems to be something like the fact that it's connected to base desires and pleasure, uh, and therefore maybe of less intellectual value. Um, so philosophers have kind of dismissed it for that reason, uh, but also for a second reason, which is to say that fantasy is somehow kind of mere escapism. Um, in other words, it's kind of removed from reality. Um, another way of maybe kind of thinking about that claim is to say that fantasy is exploratory in some way. In other words, it kind of takes us beyond the familiar or beyond the norm. Uh, and that's why some fantasies are kind of transgressive. So we can fantasize about things which actually break cultural norms. So for instance, if you fantasize about you know, murdering your mean head of department or something like that, um, then clearly that's transgressive in that it breaks a cultural norm not to murder people. Um, but we're kind of exploring some morally transgressive terrain when we do fantasize about things like that. Um, also, we can kind of see uh, fantasy as escapism when we look at kind of the, the, the way that we talk about literature. So we can, uh, we talk about fantasy novels uh, as novels which kind of create entire worlds, uh, which are often very unlike our actual world. Um, and some of those uh, fantasy worlds even build their own languages, such as Tolkien does in Lord of the Rings when he creates languages like Elvish. Um, so the, the suggestion here, I guess, the reason why philosophers think it's not creative is because it's kind of disconnected with reality and therefore of no practical value, I guess, is the thought. Um, so as I mentioned previously, I actually want to kind of defend fantasy somewhat. Um, and so to kind of build this defense, I want to come back to the claim from Pachuto and Carruthers, uh, which is that our kind of act of imagining things, pretend play was their example, but our act of imagining things is sort of hardwired to our neurological reward system. So it's not just fantasy that is connected to pleasure, but also things like uh, pretend play or imagining uh, that such and such is the case, something we, we, we want. Um, so from that point of view, um, it's kind of maybe more fair to say that rather than fantasy being dismissed because it's connected to pleasure or to desire, maybe we could just say something like, well, fantasy in particular is connected to pleasure or desire. So maybe that's a kind of uh, rather, rather tepid defense of, of, of fantasy. Um, but I think if we do agree with that reasoning, then we can conclude that we must be kind of particularly motivated to fantasize of all kinds of imagining. Uh, it's all connected to pleasure and desire. Um, also, just as a kind of another defense, maybe kind of more, more convincing defense of fantasy, there's actually some evidence from uh, the research of Gopnik that suggests uh, mentally inhabiting fantasy worlds, uh, what, what, what he terms paracosms, actually helps children build predictive theories about the real world. So in other words, um, you know, engaging in these kinds of episodes of, of pretend play where we imagine we're in some kind of uh, bizarre alternate reality actually helps us to make sense uh, of the world that we actually do live in. It's kind of, uh, rather than being a kind of, of no practical value, it might in fact turn out to be of significant practical value. Um, so why uh, do I want to kind of include fantasy as part of this solution? Well, to, to kind of make that case, I think we have to connect it back to the first component of the solution, which was language. And to do that, um, we can look at the work of Michael Tomasello, who's a kind of linguist and uh, comparative psychologist. And Tomasello identifies 
three communi uh, communicative intentions in human beings. Uh, this is to say three kind of reasons why we communicate, things or, or kind of justifications and motivations for communicating. And those communicative intentions are requesting, informing and sharing. So requesting is just asking for stuff we want. We actually see that in apes when we teach them sign language, they'll often request food. In fact, pretty much the only thing they do when you teach them sign language is request food. Um, but we also inform, um, we'll pass on information uh, and we'll share as well things like emotions or attitudes towards certain situations. Um, and actually these communicative intentions, uh, Thomas L argues, are present even in pre-linguistic infants. So infants who haven't yet developed language, um, they are still kind of demonstrating these same communicative intentions. So for instance, it, you know, a child might uh, point to an airplane it sees in the sky. Um, in doing that, it's not requesting the airplane, it doesn't want you to get them the airplane. Uh, it might be seen as kind of uh, instead informing or sharing, either kind of informing a parent that there's this kind of interesting thing up there in the sky or sharing some emotion like excitement about the fact that there's this weird thing in the sky. Um, and so what Thomas Eller concludes from this is that these uh, communicative intentions must be sort of biologically grounded somehow. Thomas Eller's argument is that it's kind of biologically grounded in adaptations specifically for making us cooperative. So he thinks we're kind of uniquely cooperative species, more so than any other animal, and that our communicative intentions fall out of uh, that kind of tendency to want to cooperate. Um, so in other words, we're kind of biologically predisposed to share information and our feelings about that information if we think it's interesting to conspecifics. So, just to kind of recount what, we're, what we've said so far about fantasy, we've said that fantasy is particularly pleasurable, um, that it often goes beyond observable reality, uh, that we're biologically predisposed to share interesting content. So I think we can kind of draw a conclusion from those three observations that uh, we should be highly inclined to share our kind of fantastic imaginings. Uh, and I think there's some evidence of this. We see it uh, in the kind of case that I mentioned previously, which is where children engage in episodes of pretend play. So for instance, when they jointly inhabit paracosms. Uh, so for instance, pretending that the floor is lava and then playing a game, which uh, the kind of rules of that game are all centered around not being able to touch the floor, because if you do, you're gonna kind of set on fire because it's lava. Um, so, if we are inclined to fantasize and we're inclined to share fantastic imaginings, then I want to argue that it's highly likely that we should use language to do this once it gets into place. So once language gets into place. So that kind of brings us uh, to the final step in the solution to the puzzle, uh, our third component of storytelling. Um, so I guess if we accept the argument that I've, I've told so far, then storytelling should be seen as likely to emerge as a kind of widespread cultural practice alongside language. That's what I'm hoping to persuade people of, uh, at least anyway. Um, but there would be a barrier to being able to do this. Um, so once language is in place, it wouldn't automatically come with a kind of fantasy lexicon, like a bunch of words that we can use to describe and refer to the fantastic imaginings that we have. So for instance, if we kind of have this idea of a half woman, half fish, which we've used our kind of faculty of language to you know, combine those simple ideas into a more complex one, uh, we wouldn't necessarily have the, the lexical item mermaid to describe that. It would take some time to get that kind of fantasy lexicon built up and put into place. Um, so the, the fantasy lexicon, we kind of expand alongside the, the, the normal lexicon, the non-fantasy lexicon of natural languages. Um, so if this is the case, um, then I want to argue that our kind of favorite fantasy lexical items would be preserved and passed on, and they would ultimately take on some kind of cultural significance within uh, different population groups. Uh, so in other words, we would tell stories that we find interesting, 
uh, because we think our our conspecifics, our, the other humans in our group, are going to find them interesting as well. The ones that turn out to be interesting um, would start to kind of build up a fantasy lexicon uh, with words like mermaid and stories about those uh, fantasy uh, ideas like mermaids would be preserved and passed on because they're interesting. They're kind of good stories to tell. They're enjoyable, they're pleasurable. And as a consequence, as they're passed on from generation to generation, they will eventually start kind of taking on a cultural significance, perhaps because those stories will be unique to different groups of uh, human beings that are kind of spread it through different points in the world. Um, so this, I, I, I totally agree if this is what you're thinking, you know, this is a very speculative assertion, right? How could I possibly know this? Um, well, I can't really because language, unlike the kind of artifacts we looked at at the very start of the presentation, uh, doesn't fossilize. We don't kind of see language fossilized in this way. So there's no way of being certain that people were telling stories uh, early on in our kind of uh, cultural history. Um, but there are some other things I think we need to keep in mind as we evaluate the thesis that I'm presenting. So the first thing is that we need to explain that gap um, that we, we talked about at the beginning, the gap which kind of pauses the, the puzzle of the creative explosion. So how can we explain that gap? Well, it could be explained by the time that it takes to build a sufficiently rich lexicon. Um, so it takes some time to build up the kind of lexical items, the list of lexical items in our language. And that could explain why the sort of delay between the emergence of the capacity for language and the emergence of creative behaviors that do fossilize like creating uh, artworks. Um, and on the note of those artworks, uh, it's also something interesting that we need to explain. So the, the, the cave art that you see in the caves in, in Europe, for instance, um, is all kind of created in places that are actually incredibly difficult to reach. It's not like you can just kind of walk into this cave and paint, start painting on the walls. You often have to go through quite narrow tunnels, uh, you know, encountering lots of different kind of dangerous uh, scenarios. Uh, to finally get to the point where these cave paintings appear. And it's not just adults who went to, to kind of create or see these cave paintings, it's also children as well, which makes it all the more surprising because it's kind of taking children on this really dangerous journey. Um, so that suggests that these, uh, these, these paintings actually have a kind of huge cultural significance to the groups who created them and went to view them. Um, also, the cave paintings include depictions of narratives. Um, so we see uh, depictions of events, things like hunting. Um, so, a, you know, a hunter killing a particular bison or some such thing. And also includes, very interestingly, uh, some hybrid figures as well. So half human, half animal figures. Um, so whatever the solution to the puzzle of the creative explosion is, Again, it would be more persuasive if it could explain creative practices that have exactly these sorts of features. So I want to kind of keep that in mind when we're assessing whether or not my particular thesis is persuasive. So to kind of just add a little more kind of credibility to the claim that storytelling would have emerged early as a cultural practice for us, um, we should revisit the idea of, of how old storytelling might actually be. So I think we probably view it as something that we do now, but maybe didn't start until, you know, maybe a few thousand years ago, maybe kind of uh, the ancient Greeks or, you know, just slightly prior to that, perhaps, who knows? Well, it turns out that there's actually some research which suggests that storytelling is a much older cultural practice than we might originally think. Um, so the work of uh, Julian Doy suggests that uh, those ancient Greek myths, things like Odysseus and the Cyclops, uh, actually date back many thousands of years prior to the kind of Greek version of that story. Uh, and Doi kind of came to this conclusion by uh, adopting a combination of methodologies and data from evolutionary biology, from mathematics, from sociology, from paleoanthropology. And ultimately he came to the conclusion that uh, those stories, what he calls mythemes, uh, the kind of core components of those stories, actually can be traced back many tens of thousands of years. Um, in fact, even as far back as some of the cave paintings that I was just talking about. 
So if this is the case, then the practice of storytelling might actually be able to explain some of these cave paintings, cave paintings which would otherwise be kind of mysterious. You know, why go to the risk of, of you know, going through these caves and dragging your child along with you uh, to just paint a picture, you know, kind of otherwise meaningless picture on the wall of the cave. Well, clearly you need some explanation for why humans would be motivated to do this. And what I want to suggest is that if there's already a culture of storytelling in place, then it would make sense to kind of go out of your way and paint those paintings um, because those story to, uh, stories that you've been telling would have a kind of cultural significance. Now, the reason there would be a cultural significance to those stories, I think, is because presenting narratives helps to build social bonds. It could also destroy them as well because you can present false narratives about other social groups, for instance, uh, which could undermine uh, relationships between groups. But I'm going to be focusing on, on the building of social bonds more in this particular instance. Uh, and there's a theory uh, of, by Robin Dunbar that actually uh, using language in this way, kind of gossiping, spreading information about each other, um, is itself a kind of vocal grooming. Um, so what we mean by this vocal grooming is that it's a kind of uh, a verbal equivalent to the sort of grooming you see uh, take place with ape populations, where they will kind of sit and groom each other uh, to kind of build bonds and reinforce social hierarchies. Uh, Dunbar suggests that once you kind of get to a certain population size, that's just not an efficient way of maintaining those relationships because you can only groom one person at a time. So as a result, he uh, suggests language kind of evolved as a sort of cheap way of grooming many people at the same time. Uh, so he kind of advocates this idea that we kind of gossip as a way of building those social relationships and maintaining social relationships. And uh, stories in particular are a good way of preserving or making more memorable information that we want to pass on as we try to build those social bonds. So it could be practical information, you know, where's a good place to find bison to hunt. It could be moral information about what we do or don't accept within a particular social group. It could be social information, the kind of thing that Dunbar has in mind when he talks about building social bonds, this person is in charge now, he's the leader, you should follow him, that kind of thing. Um, and what makes them a kind of effective vehicle, stories that is, what makes it an effective vehicle is that they can prompt an emotional response in the hearer. And that's what kind of makes them stick with us. It makes them memorable and it kind of promotes a kind of resonance with that story. Um, so, the emergence of language then would give us a kind of infinitely rich resource for building these kinds of narratives. And what's kind of interesting about Hinzen's view of this is that this kind of computational process operates blindly. So in that case, it kind of makes it a perfect system for very quickly generating new ideas. We can just start combining lexical items, if we like. So things like the evil hammer, we can just put the idea of evil and the idea of hammer together and then we can assess whether or not that is a useful or desirable idea once it's generated. So we can come up with the idea first and then see if we can make any use of it. Um, so this gives us a kind of infinite generative resource for expressing the kinds of fantasies that we talked about earlier on. Uh, and these fantasies, if you remember, are things which we are naturally highly motivated to do. We're highly motivated to engage in fantasy because the rewards of fantasizing uh, a, a kind of a, a portion of the rewards of the actual thing. So fantasizing about sex makes you feel sexy, fantasizing about food makes you feel hungry and so on. So we get some of the rewards alongside the, the process. So to recap the argument that I, I put forward from my own solution, um, what I've said is that Pachuto and Carruthers solution doesn't stand up to the evidence, right? And in fact, what the evidence suggested was that pretend play itself is something that needs to be explained. So we could ask, well, what kind of traits could explain the emergence of pretend play? Well, I'm arguing that a combination of language, fantasy, and storytelling solves the puzzle of the creative explosion. So in other words, it explains that puzzling gap that we started off with. Uh, it explains the gap by saying that our lexicon needed to develop before our tendency to engage in fantasy and to share that fantasy 
uh, could make use of it, so before it could make use of language in the form of storytelling. But this solution also explains pretend play, because children can only construct these sort of paracosms, these fantasy worlds, once we have the tools to do that, once language gets into place and we start using that to develop that fantasy lexicon. Uh, also, it explains the character of the creative explosion. In other words, it explains why we went out of our way to make cave art. Um, because once we've got stories in place that have cultural significance, then it would make sense that we'd want to go and create kind of visual uh, representations of those stories so that they're preserved in a more concrete form. So whereas language doesn't fossilize, we might want to kind of create some permanent record of it through the creation of cave art. So that is my explanation or my solution to the puzzle. And those are the reasons why I think it's a good solution or a better solution than Pachito and Carruthers solution. And with that in mind, uh, I want to kind of open up to any questions at this point. Thank you so much, Dr. Andy, for that wonderful talk. It's quite interesting that um, first, like language, though it's not the only source, operates well in understanding how humans become creative. And another interesting point is how fossilization is discussed differently in your talk. I believe that most people who have studied second language acquisition, fossilization has a very different definition. But in this case, it shows that fossilization operates in a way that it, language doesn't stop. It continuously evolves in time. And there's nothing as old language, but it's just adapting as to how the human brains or how language or the, the yeah, language, how language develops in the mind of the people and the people they get in contact with. So <clears throat> with that, we would like to open the floor for questions. If there's anyone who would want to ask their questions personally, you're very much welcome to turn on your microphone. But if you feel shy, feel free to send your message and I'll, I'm going to read that for you. Yeah. Um, can, can I ask? Okay, go on. Yeah, um, your point of view is quite interesting. And uh, I do believe that uh, fantasy uh, is part of uh, creativity and it also helps uh, with the imagination. I, I guess that's why we have Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I think it, it came from the uh, imagination that um, the train, you can go through the wall and all that stuff. So that's, that's quite interesting. Now, the, the next question is, suppose like me, like if, if I'm, I, I'm not quite creative, so how, how can I, as a, uh, a writer, enhance my creativity and, and, and bring this into my writing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, certainly from the history of philosophy, um, the kind of traditional analysis of creativity might have said that there's no real hope for you, right? Um, because I think philosophers typically used to see creativity as connected somehow to divine inspiration, right? So they would see, you know, things like poets, for instance, or Aristotle, Plato, so, so poets as kind of mouthpieces of the gods. So artists on that view were pretty much kind of like passive vessels for the creativity that, that comes from uh, divine inspiration. Um, I don't think that's an accurate uh, sort of <laughs> thesis, however. Um, so I think instead, if you look at the kind of the cognitive basis for creativity, um, then we can say that, you know, clearly there's, there's some sort of neurological um, adaptations which enable creativity. I've argued that one set of that is clearly linguistic. Um, but there will be other kinds of uh, imagining that are involved in that process as well. So kind of visual imagining, for instance, um, you could do in the absence of language. I think that predates uh, the emergence of language, being able to kind of picture an object, uh, mentally rotate it and so on. And of course, what we know from, from neurological research is that you can kind of strengthen neurological bonds, right, by effectively exercising your cognitive muscles in those domains. So I guess the, 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 the answer to the question is probably something like practice being creative, right? So practice trying to generate new ideas and make uses of those ideas. Of course, it's very easy to say that, but it's another thing to be able to do it. And of course, what counts as a sort of creative might vary rapidly, like vary quite drastically across populations, across individuals, um, because of course, 
for, for things to count as creative, they have to be valuable in some way. They have to be kind of uh, novel in some way, new uh, in some way. So we might very well exercise our creative writing skills and write what we think is a wonderful piece of literature with a really original idea. Um, but only find out, you know, subsequently that somebody else has done that very thing already. So we might think, well, actually, it's not quite so creative. But of course, from a, a kind of personal uh, point of view, subjective point of view, there is still that degree of creativity involved. So I think one thing is probably to not be discouraged by the creative works of others. But another thing is probably to practice being creative as much as possible. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruby. Ruby is actually, I mean, her, her thesis was on stylistics, on language and literature. So that's why this question is very much relevant to her. Thank you, Ruby. Um, do we have any more questions? Anyone who would like to ask? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I, I have, I'm, I'm now having uh, maybe one or two questions. All right. um, can, okay, can I start now? Sure, sure. Right, Can you uh, thank please, you. Uh, introduce yourself. I, right, uh, my name is uh, Pisuda from Sutirak, and uh, I'm actually teaching English at uh, Bangkok University. Um, I used to do my um, research in children's literature, uh, particularly uh, fantasy literature. So um, I'm sorry, it's not uh, quite convenient for me to turn on the camera just now. Um, well, <laughs> as, as for my questions, um, can you please explain a little bit more about uh, the concept of um, creative explosion? I mean, like, um, do you see this as the uh, limited to material artifact, or is it uh, represented or being brought out in 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 other ways in in, in human in humans' life as well? I, I mean, you you might have mentioned uh, you might have already mentioned about this, but. I'm, I'm sorry, but I did not quite catch it. I mean, the, the, the concept or the framework of the uh, creative explosion. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, so I guess um, it's probably worth pointing out at this juncture then that this puzzle of the creative explosion really isn't a puzzle at all, uh, not in the sense that I've kind of set it up. So at some point in time, people looked at this archeological record and said, well, there was nothing going on for this length of time. And then suddenly around 60,000 years ago, at one, at one point we used to say 40,000 years ago, there was a sudden explosion in creativity. But what we actually see uh, just go on, since I've written this thesis and you know, kind of, uh, you know, every year there's some new discovery, which actually puts back creative behaviors even further in time. So for instance, um, around about 8,000 years ago, uh, we were, in, in caves in South Africa, uh, carving pieces of orca with different designs, possibly numerical notation. Now that wasn't included in the evidence that I presented in this presentation. Um, and th there are kind of many discoveries like this that actually suggest that the gap that I've been talking about might be very narrow indeed. Um, so not this kind of 100,000 or 60,000 year gap. Now, what's kind of interesting about that is I think that actually, if that's true, it supports my thesis more. So what's surprising about um, the kind of the, the, the creative explosion, I Andy signal is no, we can wait. Okay. Andy, sure. you can continue from the creative explosion. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, so yeah, so the, the, this, this supposed gap that uh, I've been talking about may actually be narrower uh, than we thought. And what I, what I want to suggest is that's actually, uh, rather than being a problem for my thesis, that is in support of the thesis I develop. And that is because it's kind of surprising that it would take language a long time to build up and to develop and impact uh, other kinds of creative behavior. And the reason that's surprising is because if we look at the, the development of natural languages, we can see that that can happen in just a few generations. So for instance, in Nicaragua, um, there were children who were placed in a 
deaf children who, who basically had developed some kind of home sign language with their parents uh, were placed into schools with other children who had the same sort of background. So by home sign language, I just mean a very basic system for communicating what they needed from their parents, you know, how they wanted a drink, they want something to eat, this kind of thing. And that system that they had was unique to that particular family. But what happened was that in Nicaragua, they decided to set up schools for deaf children. And they took all of these children who had their home sign systems and put them into schools together. And within just a few generations, the, the, how quickly their linguistic skills evolved was unbelievable. They, they went very quickly to developing a basic grammar, to agreeing a set of signs that they would use in common. So they would substitute out their home signs for ones that as a community they, they agreed upon. And within, I think, three generations, uh, fully syntactic sign language had emerged without any kind of real design behind it. It just happened naturally. So this is what, what Pinker calls the language instinct, um, just kind of in full effect, you know, kind of natural ability to develop language um, kind of happening in a very, very uh, rapid way. So what's kind of surprising when you look at the, the thesis I presented is that if there was a, a huge gap between uh, the emergence of language and creative behaviors, we, you know, the, the, the suggestion that, well, it just took some time for our lexicon to build isn't really that persuasive because that should happen over just a handful of generations if, you know, modern evidence is anything to go by. Um, so instead, what I want to say is that actually storytelling would emerge very, very quickly. And of course, storytelling is an incredibly creative thing to do. So there is no real gap between the emergence of creative behavior and the emergence of language in our species. It happens probably within a few generations, but what it takes is a little bit of time for us to develop creative practices, which will ultimately survive in the paleoanthropological record. So the puzzle really isn't a puzzle. I've been kind of disingenuous in setting it up that way. Um, so yeah, I don't think that creativity really did take quite the amount of time to get into place or to in, in the way that um, we see it at, at the time of the creative explosion. Um, I, I think maybe that, that isn't an accurate representation on my part, um, deliberately so, I have to say, but they, you know, that's you know, the kind of the way that is set it up. So I, I hope that answers the question or answers it to some degree. I'm not sure if it does. Well, yeah, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I asked you about this because I, I, I found your talk very interesting. And actually, um, I, I mean, I might be looking from, um, um, I might be looking at a different, uh, viewpoint or different field like um for example i i have seen some saying or quotations that sometimes um storytelling is an important uh important means to guide our lives i mean uh some even say that our life is a is the story that we create I, I i mean like for example i i this is my um this is my personal experience with when I was young, I mean, like, um, I usually imagine or um, not not kind of fantasize, but imagine stories of other people. And I tell that in my head, I tell that to myself. And I, I when I look back now, I see that, okay, uh, part of my life at the moment, some somehow a little bit, a little bit resembled those those kind of stories that I used to tell myself when I, when I was young. I mean, so I I, I see I see that yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you that um, language, fantasy, and story is really is it is a real good combination that that has an important part in our lives. Yeah. So yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. No, you're very welcome. I mean, just to kind of uh, comment briefly on, on, on that observation. So you, you said that you're kind of interested in uh, children's fantasy literature in particular. Um, I, I think that the, the point you just made is really interesting as a possible basis for the development of human empathy, right? Because when, once we can kind of tell narratives about other humans, we can kind of think from their perspective then we can really start to build and deepen uh, our ability to kind of empathize um, mm -hmm. with other humans. And obviously that in turn helps society bond. And I think Michael Tomasello, who I mentioned, uh, he sees that as, as kind of a, the basis of our kind of uh, cooperative nature. You know, I mentioned that Tomasello suggests we are kind of uniquely cooperative. Uh, 
And one of the reasons that he thinks that is the case is because we can kind of read minds, right? We can do this thing, theory of mind, where we can think about what other people might think. And as a consequence, we can empathize with their, their reasons for wanting to do something, and therefore we can uh, start to build those social bonds. And um, one of the kind of, another sort of interesting point to do with, with sort of children in particular and, and fantasy um, is that I, I mentioned that philosophers kind of dismissed fantasy as, as somehow unimportant to creativity. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because of the kind of escapism of, of children's fantastic imaginings, right? It's just kind of getting away from reality. But if you look at the evidence that you actually engage in episodes of, uh, of, of fantastic imagining, uh, you know, creating paracosms, they tend to be happier, healthier, well-adjusted children. It's not people who have a need to escape reality. In fact, it's mm -hmm. quite the opposite. It's children who are wanting to explore realities beyond their own. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting um, thing, I think, when you're thinking about fantasy literature, that the children who are probably going to be most interested in this are going to be the ones who are really kind of happy and healthy and well adjusted, uh, yeah. rather than the ones who are trying to get away from reality somehow. All right. Thank you so much, Stefan, and thank you for that question. We have one question before I post that. This is something I observed earlier. Um, like, I, I'm not from a second language acquisition area, but I'm more of a sociolinguist. But what I observe is that the universality and computational nature in the way language is viewed cognitively often poses several arguments, such as you know, grammaticality, restrictions, even predictability of acquisition and errors. But one thing I've observed from the talk is that. Um, how these various lexical items are connected and form creative output that could have emerged from or even lead to a fantasy. So this is quite interesting in, in that point because we are not seen as limitations or possibly errors. So like various, um, various items or various lexical items put together can be a creative way of expressing one's fantasy or, one, or, or oneself. And I think that that's quite refreshing to, to, to hear, particularly in a different area. Now, um, let me read one question. The question goes, um, you said about why fantasy has been largely dismissed by philosophers and imagination is more welcomed. Can you explain more how imagination is more associated with cognitive faculty and how it is distinct from fantasy? Sure. Um, so I guess maybe it might be in the way that I kind of set it up is the problem, but uh, it isn't the case of kind of imagination versus fantasy. Um, so much it is that fantasy, at least in, in my view, and I think others do accept this, fantasy is part of that really broad uh, faculty of imagination. Um, so I said that, you know, it's, it's not really possible to give a simple taxonomy of the imagination. I think there's, when I, when I tried doing that uh, as part of my thesis, I started building a taxonomy of what philosophers have said about imagining and, and the different kinds that they highlight. I think I got as far as 60 something different kinds of imagining and then decided that it was a bit of a fool's errand and gave up. Um, but one of those uh, kinds of imagining is fantasy. What is kind of uh, dismissed by philosophers is the level of creativity involved in fantasizing. Um, so that's really the kind of thing that I'm taking issue with because philosophers seem to dismiss it as uncreative in some way or in some, somehow not useful to being creative. Um, and the reasons why seem to be that because it's somehow, because it's connected to desire uh, and it's just wish fulfillment or because it's uh, somehow disconnected from reality. Um, but actually what you see when, when you look at uh, fantasy in a bit more detail and you can give it kind of a fair shot um, is that, you know, I, well, for one, I think fantasy isn't necessarily connected with desire. I think you could fantasize about things which are undesirable. Um, I, I don't think there's anything kind of logically incoherent about claiming that. Um, I think you can simulate fantasies of other people as well. So I think you can kind of um, do something similar to what Basida was saying, which is kind of imagine the, the fantasies of others, think about their kind of stories that they might tell. Um, so I think there's different ways of, of engaging with fantasy involved desire. Um, but also, 
we see evidence that, that the evidence that I mentioned from Gothnik that actually um, engaging in fantasy um, might very well enhance creativity rather than um, be distinct from it somehow. So I, I think, you know, for, for me, fantasy is kind of subsumed under the broader term of imagination uh, rather than being kind of a distinct faculty. Um, it's kind of part of the imaginative faculty. Thank you so much. We have another question. It reads, do you think human also uses narratives or fantasies to cope with fear as well? Like to make stories, to rationalize things, to make, I'm sorry, um, to make the unknown become more familiar so that they can feel safe or secure? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so absolutely, I think we do, but probably more worryingly, I think we also use narratives and fantasies to instill fear in others as well. So I think um, even in ourselves, actually, at times, I think we, you know one, one kind of interesting thing is that we're we're really interested in horror movies, right? I mean, that, like, why? I don't, I don't quite understand why we want to terrify ourselves so much, but it seems that we we do actually do this. And I think what you see in the case of uh, young children, for instance, is quite often they will engage in sort of fantastic imaginings about something like you know they hear a creak of a floorboard in their bedroom and they'll conjure up an explanation which is well beyond reality it kind of you know verges into the fantastic there's some monster that wants to get them you know kill them somehow um, and actually that can that can instill fear in themselves once they start imagining that it's that rather than you know it's just a creaky floorboard uh, then they they can scare themselves uh, as a result of that so I think we, we can kind of use fantasies in relation to fear in, in a number of ways. Um, certainly to cope with fear, we could, um, you can imagine a scenario certainly where um, we want to kind of fantasize that the world is not as it is, right? We want to imagine that, you know, people aren't really as bad as they appear in terms of, you know, say that we can look at kind of the political situation in the US and we might fantasize that their previous president wasn't a sociopath. Um, but we might very well be doing that just to help us deal with the fear that somebody like that might have access to the nuclear courts. Um, and so I think, you know, we can definitely do that. And then I think where we use it to instill fear is in creating narratives, false narratives about other groups of human beings, right? Where we kind of portray Republicans as all right-wing gun fanatics, or we portray uh, all foreigners as wanting to come over and take our jobs and this kind of thing. And we present these false narratives uh, to elicit that emotional response because that's what storytelling is great at. Um, so, you know, it kind of, it, it's not only great at instilling that emotional response, but also, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, it's great at kind of preserving the idea because it becomes very memorable. So presenting false narratives, as we see in the media quite often, can lead to, to very, you know, incredible stories, you know, things we should never believe becoming commonly accepted. And often there are kind of negative social impacts of that as well. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Andy. Do we have anyone who would like to ask more questions? Yes, I would like to ask a question, may I? Go on, go on Professor Adam. Yes, I have a, uh, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Andy, for this uh, for this great talk. I have uh, one uh, one comment and one question. The comment is about language as a prerequisite to creativity, um, and the, and the whole notion where it all started and when it all started. Was it in Africa? Was it later? Well, um, of course, it's a, it's a it's a uh, it's a vague area. Language is a big word. It may mean various things at various stages of complexity. And it's not easy to say that it actually uh, developed before or after humans left Africa. It may have been some sort of proto-language or, or rather a proto-ability to, to engage in languaging to, as a kind of behavior, uh, possibly and uh, predominantly for the purpose of communication. But then you don't need language to be able to communicate. You can communicate with all, all sorts of other systems that, are, that do not have the, the, the full potential of, of, of language. Uh, so, so we probably have in mind some kind of language-like behavior 
which at various stages is not that different from what animals do. And it's, it's not very easy to draw the, to draw the distinction between these, these two. So that's just, just uh, but it's, it's a big area. I know we have a discussion on, on, on this here because it's a huge, it's a huge, huge area. My real question has to do with um, the language as a, as a genitive mechanism um, uh, for constructing new utterances, which is based on universal grammar that you mentioned. Um, well, one, one of the problems with universal grammar and, and this idea of Chomsky's idea of language as a, uh, as a generative mechanism is that it taps onto what I would say syntactic creativity or what or productivity. Language is, is a productive mechanism for handling and manipulating sequences uh, of symbols. Uh, with storytelling and generally with, with language in use, I think that there's, um, what is at stake is creativity in a, in, a, in a broader sense, or perhaps a somewhat different sense, something like being able to connect form and meaning. Mm -hmm. And this leads to creativity in terms of polysemy, symbolization, control in the sense of uh, being able to portray the same situation in various ways from various perspectives or angles. And, and for this, we need to be able to, to, to develop an ability to engage in abstract thinking, which involves um, the ability to see parts as well as holes. Not just holes, not, not just holes themselves, but also parts of these holes and be able to extract those parts and features and recombine them in a, in a systemic fashion so that uh, the abstractness that, that we create also becomes kind of, kind of organized. So um, I'm not sure to what extent universal grammar and, and the generative syntactic um, mechanism is able to handle that. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I think I may have something of an answer, but as you say, it's it's a very broad issue that we uh, probably can't hash out in, in full depth here. But um, I mean, we can maybe start with, with, with the comment that you made. So the idea of kind of language developing for communication, and of course, there are communicative systems that predate language and exist in the absence of fully syntactic language, at least. Um, and one of the things that's important, I guess, about Chomsky's uh, project is that he doesn't see the main benefit of the evolution of fully syntactic language being communication. Uh, instead, he sees it as being uh, thought. So Chomsky and, and people who follow him say that actually the, the, the real benefit of having fully syntactic language isn't that we can say lots of new things so much as it is that we can think lots of new different things. Um, so... In, in a sense, you know, the, the communication aspect of it's kind of puzzling when you look at the uh, evolution of language, because as soon as you can do the kinds of things I've been talking about, i.e. construct narratives that are, have no regard for truth or falsity, then as a communicative tool, it makes itself quite an unusual thing from an evolutionary point of view, because we can kind of tell each other lies and, you know, misinformation um, and, you know, I could kind of pass myself off as as a consequence of doing that. Um, I, I should be able to pass on weaker genes, and that shouldn't be possible from an uh, evolutionary point of view. It shouldn't be shouldn't be the norm anyway. So, so there's a kind of weird thing about the way that language is used in communication that makes it sort of puzzling when we try to explain the evolution of language. And it's certainly one of the concerns. That linguists have had with explaining how language has evolved and why it's kind of preserved by uh, evolution. Uh, but I think that actually connects back to the to the question as well, which was this notion of kind of how we make sense of, of abstract thought and the role of abstract thought uh, in this, uh, you know, with relation to to eventually getting onto the point of storytelling. And yes, I mean, I guess picking up or identifying the semantic content of these utterances that, that become narratives um, is clearly going to be a, a pretty sophisticated cognitive endeavor. Um, and if you look at, I, I guess if you look at the kind of um, 
the, the kind of cognitive faculty that we had previously, you can see some examples of, as in, you know, in, in our evolutionary lineage, you see some examples of things like analogical reasoning and, uh, you know, this ability to kind of spot uh, abstract patterns in, in that regard. And I guess if Chomsky's right in saying that the primary beneficiary of language uh, isn't communication, but thought, then the thought is uh, that once language gets into place, it kind of ramps up our ability to do these different things. So it would ramp up our abilities like analogical reasoning. So we'd be able to do it in a more complex way and therefore abstract from more remote ideas to the kind of these, these other uh, connected things. So I think maybe as a, as a partial answer to the question uh, is to kind of fall back on the idea that well actually what language does is it kind of um, it, it enhances all of our other cognitive capacities and in a way that is kind of computationally cheap, right? That's the good thing about universal grammar. It's kind of maybe as few as two different rules that we can apply in a kind of computational sense that is infinitely generative. So in a sense, it, it should be kind of uh, a, a cognitively lighter way of imagining than visual imagining, which takes up more resources. And so we can kind of generate more ideas in a cheaper way. And so as, as a result of that capacity, things like analogical reasoning would be rapidly enhanced. And, and therefore things like abstract thought would in turn, be, you know, be, if, if they already existed in some capacity, would be radically deepened by the emergence of, of fully syntactic language. Does that address the question, at least in part, anyway? Yeah, it does. Yes, yes, yeah. Of course, of course, I know easy answers. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I got your point about the, the ability to lie and to tell untruth. I would, I mean, uh, I would definitely say it as a, as, as a benefit to, 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 to survival. I mean, it can be harmful, but in that sense, it can be very useful because mm -hmm. you can lie to your enemy and you can, you can create all sorts of, uh, you know, stories telling your stories with language and with, with, with art, with your behavior, with anything that you can use to all kinds of purposes. So, so the you know, prevarication as a, as, a, as, as a fundamental feature of that, which animals are probably not able to do, at least uh, have very few species to very limited extent are able to, maybe you know, uh, uh, primates can do that to some extent, but not, not, not very well. We, we are very good at lying. And, and this is probably one of the reasons why we have uh, populated this planet for better or worse. <laughs> yeah, so I guess the, the, the thought is that it's something, uh, maybe, maybe a good way of approaching this is to think of it by comparison to something like birdsong, right? So birdsong is taken as kind of signaling reproductive fitness in some way. I don't want to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of it, but the thought is that if the bird has the full repertoire then it can impress its partner uh, and reproduce and therefore pass on its genes. Um, but usually with these sorts of uh, signals, communicative signals uh, in the animal kingdom, they're tied to actual reproductive fitness. So they, they're tied to kind of a good genetic basis for reproduction, resistance to disease or some such thing. Um, but the, the weird thing about human language is that we can say literally anything we want. So we can signal any kind of reproductive fitness that is that has no bearing on reality. Uh, and so it, you know, the things that we say don't need to be connected to any genuine kind of reason to, to want to reproduce with it. And so as it kind of pre presents a, a puzzle from that point of view as to how, you know, how it was that it got preserved, given its you know, ability to deceive and to, to kind of throw potential mates off the actual scent that you know, they should be pursuing. But I guess the other, the flip side of that is that perhaps lying itself is an example of pretty and cognition, right? It's an example of being creative. So mm -hmm. you know, we hear all kinds of creative deceit. Um, and so in a sense, maybe it does have an underlying reproductive fitness, which is that that person is actually just a very creative individual. They just use their powers of creativity for evil instead. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you so much, Professor Adam and Dr. Andy. Do we have any more questions from the floor? Um, can I have one more question? Go on, Ruby. Okay, um, you mentioned about practicing, right? Because um, I was waiting if, if I could get a chance to ask you. Practicing creative 
witty. So in that case, what would you leave us to do? Like maybe some tips to practice creativity? Like, um, yeah. I, I guess it, it depends on the domain of creativity. So I think we probably, so, so one thing that's probably worth saying, I, you know, I maybe can't give you the, the answer to that question, maybe not have a good kind of go to set of tips, but I think maybe a, a slight distinction of thought to leave you on, which might be encouraging in some way, is that um, philosophers have historically focused on uh, creativity, maybe what you, what you would call kind of creativity with a capital C, right? The kind of big creativity you see in art and in music and so on. But more recently, they've become focused uh, to, you know, some of them have become more focused on what is kind of called everyday creativity. Um, so the kind of creativity we engage in in a kind of relatively thoughtless manner every single day. So, you know, linguistically, we're creative every, you know, pretty much with every sentence we speak, you know, almost every sentence you've heard today hasn't been uttered before. I mean, that's just a kind of mathematical sort of quirk of, of, of an infinitely generative system. So using language is in, a, in and of itself to some degree of kind of creative practice. So, you know, reading, writing, speaking, the things that we probably do every day uh, are ways of practicing creativity. Um, but also we kind of, we're, we're creative in other ways in everyday scenarios. The way that we arrange uh, our cushions on the sofa, for instance, might be a creative act. I think there are kind of everyday aesthetic tasks that we gain, uh, that we kind of engage in that we just don't see as creative because historically we've tended to think of creativity as this like really big project that artists and geniuses do. But actually it's not. It's something that every single human being does every single day. So I think you're probably already practicing creativity, um, you know, just without realizing it. And I guess the more creative you, you can be, as in the, the more you kind of are willing to either experiment within a set of boundaries with, within, a, say, a genre of literature, or just kind of the, the more you're willing to push those boundaries uh, and maybe cross domains and kind of work, you know, if, if you're a writer, then try partnering with like a visual uh, artist to, to kind of see what, uh, what kind of in kind of interdomain dialogue can do in terms of enhancing your creative output. So I think, you know, the, there are kind of times and places for like big creativity, but I think it's worth keeping in mind that we are just naturally kind of creative uh, in an everyday sense, I think. So I wouldn't worry too much about getting in the practice. I think you, you probably already are. Right. Thank you so much, Ruby, for that question. And thank you so much, Dr. Andy, for that. I think that this, this kind of relates to how a language becomes a language. Basically, like, based on how you historically present your, your, your background, it was more, it, it's safe to say that, you know, many people engage in creativity and people actually might not think it is considered creative. It, it's just like in the case of language, we couldn't say a language is a language unless an authority or an institution says it is a language. So to, to somehow relate to that answer, um, basically we all engage in different activities that we may find creative in our ways. Others don't see it the same way as we do. And sometimes we do not get validated as to that creative output that we have produced. And I think that, um, that influences a lot on the way we, 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 we make our stories more engaging or sometimes people would call it dry. That's when language operates and how we find ourselves perhaps at loss and lacking in terms of the way or the techniques that we, that we, we, we do in, in our um, say storytelling or in the create, creative techniques that we, that we practice. So I think it's more of, um, just like what you mentioned, it may have happened before. It was just not recognized yet at that moment, basically because we don't have much authority or, or much evidence to claim that it is a creative one. So I think this is a very interesting point for everyone. And we would like to thank Dr. Andy for that very stimulating discussion. I believe that people from linguistics would have would really learn something quite different from how, you know, how, how linguistics is too restrictive in different um, mechanisms and how we discuss it. And I think this is a, 
let's say, a breath of fresh air in discussing language from a philosophical standpoint and narrating it to human practices such as storytelling and fantasy itself. So thanks everyone for joining us today and we hope to see you again in the next International Arts Talk Series. And thanks a lot well, for your time. Okay, just to add, if, for, for those who are into creativity, the next talk will be on literature and racism. And my good friend, Professor Rutledge, is going to talk, uh, cover something on fake news too, because he's from the United States. <laughs> so anyway, please stay tuned. Joey? Yeah, thank All right. So if, if you have any questions or should you want to be updated with the current, um, let's say, happenings in the Faculty of Arts talk, let me share the slide with you. You may visit us through our Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash faculty of arts at Shula, or you may go to the website itself, the www.arts.shula.ac.th, and all of the updates regarding um, International Arts Talk Series are posted there. So we'll see you again in the next one.